I'd like to give you yet another brief history of my GSX cylinder head. Everyone knows what they look like stock, but only those who have spent a considerable amount of time working on them would notice what I've done to it. This is what it looked like at 124,000 miles after it had been blasted and tanked. I really wish I could show you better photos of this, but in 2003, digital photography was a joke if you weren't rich. It's really nice to work with a part that's this clean because it exposes both the good and the bad. Now, to me, really it's no surprise that there would be problems with the casting. I went around the block with this one right here the first time I rebuilt it. And I want to show you something close up that you should check your head for to make sure that you don't have any problems with uh, casting. So here we are back with Mr. Bling again. And we've got casting marks. Look at the places where the mold sealed up. See around in this area here? Pay close attention to how those look on this head because something I'm going to show you in a second is one that's never been touched. Look at all that rough, loose casting. Some of it's pretty stout, I'm not going to lie to you, and a lot of it's really well attached. But sometimes there's cracks in this. As it cools, it cracks, and it makes a weak spot. And sometimes you can push on it with your finger and knock it out when it's really bad. Look back here in the corner. Let's look at this back side here. See that back surface where all that casting is really rough? And look at that right there. All right. Wild, isn't it? Well, here's mine after I worked on it. What I did with mine is I actually sat here with a hammer and a punch, and I knocked off all the loosest of the casting. I didn't want to take a whole lot out. I just wanted to take out what was weak. And you can see back here on this back edge, you can see some of my, <laughs> you can see some of my Packer tracks. Uh, and I knocked all that stuff out. I don't know why I didn't use a grinder. I, maybe I didn't want to make more metal shavings than I was already making and potentially a different problem. But uh, anyway, I spent a lot of time on this. One of the oil galleries was blocked. Um, it had a huge flake of aluminum sitting up where the, uh, where the two pieces of the mold came together there. It's nearly completely obstructing it. I've got pictures. I took this opportunity to polish the living daylights out of it and to clean up and correct defects I found in the casting. I spent time removing the casting grooves entirely from the outside of the head and the valve cover. Here's a few examples of this. From a performance standpoint, there's absolutely no value in doing any of this stuff. I just did it because I wanted to compete in car shows and go the extra mile. I hand sanded the head and valve cover from 220 grit to 1200 grit before attacking it with black and white rouge and polishing wheels. This part of the job to me wasn't about performance, more about art. I'd say that my efforts were successful because this car brought home six trophies competing in three categories of two different car shows over the next two years that followed. But if you don't have those kinds of goals in mind, it's probably not worth your effort. The areas you should pay attention to the most is what lurks under the valve cover and inside the oil return galleries. You probably don't want flakes of aluminum breaking loose and ending up in your oil pan. That, in my opinion, is the worst of it. Half the cylinder heads I've handled have had these kinds of simple problems. When the DSMs were hot commodities at dealerships, there was actually a shortage of these cars and Mitsubishi had to rush production to meet demand. This is a byproduct of that scenario. A little bit of time deburring this would have been a good thing in my opinion, but it would have cost them time and money, so since it wasn't done when it was cast and built, I did it myself. Before I move on to the concept of porting a DSM cylinder head, or show you the one I paid a lot of money to have ported by a professional, I'm going to need to grow a third arm to hold the light. You're never going to know what I'm talking about if you can't see it. I had someone else do the head assembly because I didn't have the time or the tools then. Along with that job came a pretty hefty bill for port work. Not including the cams or springs, I had nearly a thousand bucks tied up in this head. I'm going to show you what was done and what not to do if you're doing this kind of work yourself. Porting isn't about making the ports bigger, it's about making them flow better. All you want to do is to gasket match the ports so that there's no step where they meet up. You want to remove the casting lines where the mold came together and clean up the bowls behind the valves. If you lower the floor, you're actually hurting performance. 
if you must enlarge anything, you want to raise the roof because the transition to the valves will always be on the ceiling. And that's what you need to keep in mind the whole time you're doing this. There are bigger benefits from enlarging the bowls and smoothing the transitions behind the valve seats than there is in any kind of work you do to the runners. So don't ever flip out and bore the whole runner larger than what you've already got here. There's absolutely no benefit in that. It negatively affects port velocity, which is crucial to atomizing your fuel. The game is all about flow and minimizing restriction. So what about the bowls? Well, you can see here where the valve seat is pressed and installed into the aluminum head. The seat is installed straight into a curved cast part. There's overhang in the form of basically a wall with a deep sharp edge where the seat meets up to these intake ports. Let me get a pen or something, I'll show you. This one's ridiculous, look. Are you convinced? Is it all that difficult to see how you can improve flow here? When air hits a restriction, it creates turbulence and slows the airflow. Turbulence is a good thing where fuel is being mixed, but it's not such a good thing in the middle of a transition. Flow can be greatly increased by removing this step. Don't just hog it out. Blend it. Do this on all of the valves exactly the same way. They absolutely have to be identical because it can actually change your air-fuel ratio in one cylinder if one flows better or worse than the others. Since the valve seats are machined identically prior to installation, you can just time yourself on each port and set an alarm for when to stop. The average smartphone has these features. The key is to use what's available to you to ensure accuracy. Nothing wrong with this method if you can't afford a 5-axis CNC machine. For a more precision method, use a set of telescoping gauges. The 3 quarter inch to 1 and a quarter inch is adequate for the whole job where the bowls are concerned. It takes a lot of time drawing and documenting your measurements with this method, and you should do it before and after you do the porting work, but it can be done with extreme precision this way. It's best to use an appropriate micrometer. This example of one before and after measurement should give you an idea of the differences between my ported head and the stock head. Here's the seat measurement of the stock intake seat. just to show you here how much material has been removed. It's best to bore the seats with precision equipment rather than hand tools because it leaves a better hole. Here's the seat measurement of the ported head. You can see how much has been removed in the boring and porting process at the edge of the seat. The measurements that matter would be deeper in the runners and at different angles across the port. So that's another illustration of how to keep tabs on your progress. You're not digging a hole to China, you're peeling an apple. When I still had a 2G intake manifold on this head, I gave both of these mating surfaces the same gasket matching treatment and only blended it about three quarter of an inch into each part. That's all you want to do and it really isn't much material. The gasket's pretty close to those edges already. When you're doing this, you want to bolt down the old gasket before making your markings for how far to go. The dividers that split the air to different valves have been knife edged here, and that shape is tapered into each of the bowls. Another thing done which some of you might have noticed is the valve guides are notched. They're notched in the direction of airflow to reduce drag around the valve stems. Some people grind the intake guides flush with the bowl, and that's acceptable, but you can't get away with that trick on the exhaust valves because of the intense heat they experience. With that much valve stem exposed, the valves really suffer. You gotta have some ridiculously strong valves made out of expensive materials if you want to withstand temperatures like that. Don't grind your exhaust valve stems flush or you'll melt the valves in no time. The best news is that you really don't need to do much with the exhaust runners as far as porting is concerned. You don't need to knife edge the dividers or the valve guides. Just sand the rough cast, blend the seats, and call it a day. All that stuff we talked about with port velocity still matters when it comes to spooling a turbo, and the 2G head has bigger exhaust ports than the 1G already. You could go buck wild and polish the ports until they shine if you want, but I can't promise you that that extra polishing will pay off with significant horsepower gains. My car fluctuates a few horsepower between runs of the tracks, and you'll never notice it on the butt dyno. You would need a flow bench. Let's take another look at the stock intake port. You'll see the divider is a big fat round glob of rough cast. If you look closely, you'll see there are several distinct angles molded into its face. The intent was to deflect and aim air towards the center of the valve and away from the seat. You would want to maintain these angles in the knife edge you create while porting it. Don't eliminate them or blend them together. You need them and the turbulence they create. Notice the injectors fire right at them. 
You're going to enlarge the bowls and runners slightly in this process, so you'll need to contour the areas of the roof past the divider and adjacent to the valve guides right into the bowls. That's what I mean by raise the roof. You'll need to blend the roof into the bowls. There's also a little ramp in front of the valve guide, but the area next to the valve guides is what you want to cut a little bit wider. You want to just grind away the rough cast close to the valve guides. Try to leave the back of the valve guide shrouded like this because it reduces drag. You absolutely must maintain a smooth gradual curve all the way around the bowl and to make each one exactly the same. That said, you can guess how much time this takes. It takes a lot of time. It takes more patience than anything else, so go play in your zen garden for a while before you start and make peace with your household and neighbors. I wouldn't want a pissed off machinist porting my head, and that includes me. I want to slow things down a little bit and talk about tools. There's some tools that are good to use for this job, and some of them just aren't cut out for it. This is a good example of one that's not cut out for it. This is my Dremel. I got a flex shaft on it, and uh, the bits for these things are ridiculously expensive if you shop by a name brand. If you're astute at finding deals, and you found that nice little store called Harbor Freight, occasionally you'll see these things go on sale for 10 bucks. 249 piece accessory kit that's got just about everything imaginable. Cut off discs, polishing compounds, sanding discs, polishing wheels, sandpaper drums, burrs, arbors, collets, grinding stones, drill bits, wire brushes. I always stock up on these things and keep a couple of them around. They're 10 bucks. If you were to buy all of these tools from Dremel, you'd probably spend upwards of $400. But if you have to use this thing for detail work, you want to look out for stuff like that. Another tool you don't want to use is an electric die grinder. And that's a carbide bit on the top of it here. And this one's a double cut one, so it's not actually for aluminum. The uh, single cut burrs are the ones you want to get for aluminum stuff because they don't get clogged up. You could probably get away with this. You just have to keep the bit cold and oiled. The reason why you don't want to use a tool like this is because when you hit the switch on this thing, it's... It's 10,000 RPMs or nothing, and there's not really a whole lot of control with that. This is too much tool for doing a head porting job. What you really want to use is something that gives you variable speeds and gives you the flexibility to be able to start and stop on a dime and something you can get a good grip on. So uh, I picked up a while back this straight shaft pneumatic die grinder, and uh, this thing is perfect for this job. If you have to use a burr, they fit this collet, you can reach into the shallow areas with that. If you need to get deep into the head with something like this, you'd need a very long shaft on it. And this is excellent for getting the job done. And the reason it works well You can run it at high and low speeds and you can regulate the air supply to slow it down even further. So what you want to use for doing the bulk of the work that you're going to perform are actually cartridge and spiral rolls. And there's the Harbor Freight part number if, uh, if you're looking for these things. You probably need about four packs of these to get through a cylinder head. And it comes with little straight shaft drums. This is great for doing the, in, the uh, runners on each one of the ports. You get these tapered ones, which are even better for reaching into the tight spaces around the valve stems and blending into the bowls deeper into the ports. Also for uh, cleaning up the knife edges. Also in the kit, you get an arbor. You just cram this thing on there and screw it in. It holds on pretty good using the threads in this tapered piece. And make sure that you have the cartridge on in the direction the correct direction so that it doesn't unspool the moment you put torque on it. If you flipped it over backwards and spun it the wrong way, it would come apart in a heartbeat. A tool like this grants you a lot more control. It's very well balanced. It's easy to articulate the angle on it by moving the back end of it around. And there are places where you want to be really careful and focus on what you're grinding and what you're not grinding. Here you can see the radiuses on the valve seat. You want to make sure that you never ever slip and end up on this top side of these radiuses. This top surface, the radius where the valve seats, the area below it where it tapers to the valve seat, these areas are off limits. It's what happens about halfway down the valve seat and beyond that you want to focus on. This is where you want to do all your blending work. So you want to be really careful that you have the air tools angled properly as they remove material. 
You gotta make sure that you keep it below that line and do not slip. If you do that, you may end up having to replace a seat or cut a seat again or regrind the seat. A rough cast, of course, is a stock head. If all you're doing is removing the rough cast inside of these bowls, then that's all you ever need. If you're blending the seats, you can get away with just using these sanding wheels. You just need to stay away from the top edges of the valve seats. And if you even think for a second about using a carbide burr in this area, you better think twice about working in a way that makes it easy for you to slip. Plan your movements. Don't take off an uneven amount of material. You want to just use these lightly whenever you use them. I would recommend on a stage one port job that you not use these at all. I know what you're thinking. Jaffro, this is a horrible tease. You got all these great tools laying around. You got a stock head and you got a ported head for reference. And you're not going to port these things for us, man? Yeah, don't worry, guys. I'm going to do it. But I haven't played in my Zen Garden yet. I gotta get one project finished before I start working on the next. So at least I have the starting point for these tools. I'd like to get another arbor and a whole lot more of these. I don't like this kit so much because uh, it's only one grit. I don't get to have my choice between coarse, medium, and fine. And you need to have, since this is a 16 valve head and this thing comes with only 10 of them in a kit, you're gonna need at least two to four of these things for every single one of these runners and in order to stay consistent you should start every runner with a new wheel especially if you're using the timing method and uh, keeping track of how much material you remove that way so anyway I don't have everything I need to do with it yet and I'm not going to start something I'm not going to finish I just wanted to take some time to outline the process and explain what it takes to port a cylinder head for anybody who might have been following along through their project and was considering doing something like this themselves the biggest benefits the average person would ever see from this is just in removing the rough cast the stage two port job, you're removing deeper material and contouring pieces and cutting out valve stems and things like that. That's a stage two. Anything stage three is going to be CNC ported so that every port is precision and identical. You're not going to achieve those kinds of results doing this with hand tools without a ridiculous amount of measurement and time and effort spent. The average machine shop doesn't have a flow bench, but the average machine shop will port your head. It's just because they know which areas they need to focus on. There are also great videos here on YouTube which demonstrate the use of the tools I just showed you. Some of those videos are sponsored uploads from the tool suppliers themselves and they go into great detail about these techniques and the products they sell. They're worth your time. I recommend watching them. There are also videos of people going through great lengths to port match 1G manifolds to fit onto 2G heads. My take on that is use what you've got to work with and make it all fit correctly. People have been doing that for a long time and there's already a lot of information out there about it. Do your research first. When it's done right, it's not a mistake. But my opinion is that it's not an upgrade if nothing else is changing. Even though the port sizes of the 1G and 2G heads are very different and in theory you can fit more air through a bigger hole, the valves on either the 1G or the 2G heads are exactly the same size. People have discovered that you can make a 1G head flow better by actually adding metal to the intake ports. I personally would rather have higher port velocity over port volume, so I'll be keeping all my stuff matched up with 2G parts.